Welcome back to Let's Play Disco Elysium. Last episode, we uh, investigated the Doom commercial area and we found the novelty dice maker. Do you have any other info about this company? One moment. Ford Race Accident S.A. produces revolutionary interactive calling radio games. Those curtains prove to be surprisingly sturdy. Yell hello into the furnace. Something breaks loose in you. A mighty bellow echoes throughout the chimney's depths. The chatter of tiny voices above suddenly cease. Then... Hello? Hello, are you there? Speak to me. Hello? Did you say anything? I can't hear you. Please come upstairs. There's a safety curtain on the second floor. I'll open it. You hear a low rumble upstairs. The sound of a curtain being pulled aside. After you, officer. Right, okay. Again. Are you looking for a die? I'd like to order a die from you. Of course. Tell me what you have in mind. I'm looking for something to help me with my work. I think I have just the right one for you. She opens the top drawer of her work desk and takes something out. Two polyhedrons, red and blue, are cradled in her palm. Um, I don't get it. You're a police officer, right? Here, catch. They're a gift from me. A beautiful woman tossing you a gift. Whatever you do, don't overthink it. Totally overthinking it? Oh no! <laughs> Here, catch. They were gift from me. 58. Wave have mercy. You overthink it. Your hands can't agree what to do, and the two dice drop to the floor and scatter in opposite directions, like pearls from a broken string. The blue one disappears down the pit in the center of the room. I. Ah, down the drain, like your career. I apologize, officer. That comment was unnecessary. Pick up the red dye. That one is made of bloodstone with a lapis lazuli inlay. The other one was the inverse. There were a set, you see, but now the set is broken. It's a shame. They might have brought you luck. You definitely need luck in Martinez. Now, was there anything else? <laughs> yeah. White check. Shivers. 20%? You feel nothing. If anything, it's uncomfortably warm in here. <laughs> Leave it she at that. Has begun to idly Hidden in the uh, upper tower of the building. We are running out of things to do. And we're sort of at an impasse. Because we need to continue the investigation by talking to Everard. Oh. <clears throat> and he wants us to do something for him. So instead of doing him a favor, we're going to try to just do our own thing. All around you, rain falls on the great city of Rivershaw. Rain drips from the eaves and floods the gutters, washing the filth away. The spring thaw must be here. The snow is melting. What am I doing? Looking up at the sky, cold water dripping from your hat. What do I see? Grey sky like great battleships, clouds colliding with one another. Rain falls down on the world. How does it feel? Humid. Your coat shields you from the rain while the city shivers around you. What's in the west? Sheets of rain over the water. A flight of stairs leading into the ocean. Wave after wave washing the coast of Martinez, with its motorboats and gently swaying reeds. The ruins of a half-sunken sea fort crumble on an inlet beyond the Bay of Revachol. Ghosts rise into the sky. <laughs> Run your fingers through your dampened hair. 
Your hair is an oily mess flecked with ash from neighboring coal plants. Smokestacks rise somewhere in the distance. And in the east? The great gates of the industrial harbor are locked. A chill runs down your back. You shudder like an animal trying to shake water from its hide. Clench your teeth to stop shuddering. Behind the gates, heaps of supply crates, red and blue metal shipping containers, slick with rain. The Greater Revachol Industrial Harbor is an artificial mountain range. Immense wealth resides within, and immeasurable poverty in its shadow. And beyond that? La Jusienne, King Dri's passenger harbor, <clears throat> and cruise ships flanked by dock arms, cranes watching over the mouth of the river distributary. What across the distributary? Kuron, the lower middle class. Distributary after distributary cuts the city blocks in half. Seven-story buildings trail off into the rain. And what's beyond the Koran? A silvery curtain of rain over the houses. The class divide. You have never been there. They don't need the law east of the river. What's in the north? Tower blocks crowd one another. 4.46 millimeter bullets still lodged in their war-torn stone walls. Hallways collapse from the mortar heads of a war that was lost long ago. Clothes lines go to waste in the rain. Radios play. The news at noon. And closer to here. A yard. Rain falls onto the roof of a woodshed. The lingering odor of decomposition mixes with that of damp soil. What's in the south? A traffic jam. Rain thrumming on the roofs of motor vehicles. Inside, drivers watch water streaming down their windshields. The statue of a king shudders. He too is cold. The canal bridge has been raised. Oh, I thought that was on Wednesday. Should be Tuesday, no? What's on the other side? The road ascends. A raised motorway loops above the ghetto. Beneath its concrete columns, a sea of rooftops woodwork and tar stretches northward. Four-story buildings as far as the rain can fall. The snows melt in Jamrock. Shudder, look further. In the rain-swept distance above the rooftops of Jamrock, a repurposed silk mill stands perched above the motorway exit. Precinct 41 hunches in the rain. Your vision blurs you wipe your face with your hand. The rain stings your eyes, making you look up and blink. What's above? Coalition hero statics hang like apparitions under the cloud cover. Way up there, where rain forms, rotors flutter silently. Your sight clears. Motherfucker. This rain will not let up anytime soon. At least we are dressed for it. Let's keep moving. Okay, we can unequip this flashlight and we'll do a quick save. So, check our journal. Let's see, hidden. Hidden? Yeah, it is Tuesday. Sing karaoke, get hold of a sad song on tape. Who made the car report? Keep searching for the caller despite lacking any obvious leads. Hmm. Investigate the Doom commercial area. Report Black. <laughs> Black. Back to Plaisance. About your findings. Let's just do that now. <clears throat> You're alive and well. Don't keep me waiting now. What's in there? In that dark sarcophagus. The dark sarcophagus. Yes, yes. How was it? Tell her how ghastly it was. You know it's what she wants to hear. <laughs> Honestly, a dump. Nothing to see there. Just heaps of garbage. Someone should let the sunshine in. But, what else did you find? Did anything survive? 
No, of course not. Have you located the <coughs> entity? I talked to the entity you told me about. Her name is Neha. I didn't know that. And she's a novelty dice maker. A novelty dice maker? Well, spit it out. Why does she need the dice? For some kind of sorcery? Sometimes they use the ankle bones of sheep. <laughs> well, we did have that shivers option with her. But we failed. Hmm. She's not a sorceress or some malicious entity. She's a businesswoman like you. I don't understand. If it's not her, then where is the source of the doom? How did she explain the curse? The narrative she's built herself, it does need tearing down. She's squeezing on the pendant too tight. A drop of blood in her palm. To hell with it. Perchance you ought to just lie, sire. Five options? No curse. Capitalism. Taxidermist. Honestly, I don't have an answer yet. There are still leads to be followed, like that strange radio computer thing. You're telling me that you went in there and didn't find out anything about the curse? Of course, I should have known better than to put my hopes on a man like you. You're no Simonies ghost whisperer. You're an alcoholic. The investigation's over. I don't want you going in there anymore. You're only angering the psychic weather in here. Now, if you're not going to buy anything, there was never any other way this could have gone. She's just too far gone into her own mind. I am sorry we had to disappoint you, ma'am. Can we go now? Farewell for now, book peddler. Well, that's the choice that we've made. Let's investigate this little table. A small mountain of colorful board game boxes. There are numerous types of games for all ages. A lot of shelf space seems to be taken up by Wirral related merchandise. Look through the pile of Wirral related merchandise. An endless variety of source books, <coughs> law books, and codices litter the table. The topmost book is titled Welkin Compendium, second edition. There's also a large hardbound tome with intricate cover art The Hunters of Catawack, Boreal Creature Compendium and a pick-your-path adventure gamebook titled Tales of Wirral, Cavern of Velcrag. Books in a board game section? Who wants to read books? Anything that catches my eye. There's a box that says Wirral, 3rd edition mega setting supplements module. The side panel notes, a fantastic adventure board game, new maps and miniatures. A sticker on it displays 25 real. That price is steep, but then it's the third edition mega setting supplement, so it makes sense. Nonsense for anemic beano clouds. <laughs> I have a feeling that the password to the radio computer is within this book. We leave. Vigilance officer, what can this old carabineer do for you? I found you guys. A new bull. What is this? How are you mocking us? This isn't for Pitonk. Now, now. No need to get angry again, honey. I'm sure the officer tried his best. It's not like there's a bull kiosk here in Martinez. I'm very sorry. It's the best I could find. The best, huh? This isn't even a bull. But fine. I guess you did attempt to write your hooliganism. Consider it forgiven. Is there anything you could tell me about this rifle? It's a Bell McGrave. 4.46 caliber. Breech loading. Revachal made. Good weapon. Accurate and reliable. His moves are quick and precise as he first checks the weapon, then aims it at the sea. This man knows firearms intimately. This one's inoperable. The bolt spring is missing and the mechanism is jammed shut. 
Still a beauty. Where did you find her? In the basement there. I'm not surprised. There are probably lots of forgotten wartime weapons lying around here. Back in the day, everyone had something stashed away. As for the rifle, I don't know what else to tell you. These BM446s are an antique. No one uses them anymore. The ammunition is impossible to find. Well, thank you for your time. Hmm. Options. We can keep it as a bluff for future interactions. Yeah. Or we could sell it for about four bucks. For real, I mean. Okay. Next would be. What would be next? Oh, Alice. Inside, you see a set of steering levers, a radio microphone. Pick up the radio. This is Precinct 57. How may I assist you? Have you heard back from the ICP about the serial number? Yes. The armor was produced by Fairweather in their facilities in Betancourt, sur la clé in 42. It was part of a special order for Corps de Pharmacie, a security firm contracted to protect the interests of Orani pharmaceutical companies in the Seminine conflict. So, it seems the armor went to Seminine. That's where the paper trail ends though. Even the firm has proven difficult to track. Corps de Pharmacie has been renamed several times over in the years since the armor was issued. I'm guessing one of its names is Crenell. Yes. That is the most recent name the ICP has been able to connect to the CDP. And the one before it was Downwell. I also have one called Sediment, but I think that might be a different contractor. No, they work called Sediment. And Somatosensor, it seems. All that during the last nine years. A suit of armor like this would have been manufactured with a particular person's physique in mind. You should ask for whom this suit was fitted. A suit of armor like this would have been customized to fit the wearer. There must be a record of the person to whom it was issued. Yes, but the ICP tends to be reluctant to sell private sector records. I could try to talk them into it though. Yes, please do try. It's imperative that we learn whose armor this was. Sure. Call back tomorrow. Hopefully, I will have more information for you then. I've got nothing to say to you. Why are you wasting your time? Are you Lizzie? Elizabeth? Miss Buford? I suggest not wasting time on trivial pleasantries and focusing on why you are actually here. Titus Hardy. Even though she has excellent control over herself, something moved behind her eyes, in the way she stands. In her face. Hmm. Easy. Leo told me about you. He likes to talk a lot. You are not here to chat up the legal counsel. You are here to question these men. Are you the hardy girl? I am not. You could be Liz. You could be anything. You could even be a mod. Even a mod? Glenn. I went to law school. I am an attorney. He's right. With a face like that, she could be on the cover of Le Debutante International. <laughs> Get a grip, Glenn. She went to law school. So fucking what? Lots of models are actually really smart people, fuckwad. No, Glenn. They aren't. This didn't change her opinion of you. It's not her. She's not a hardy girl. Definitely. Drama. We'll talk later. <laughs> <sighs> the bed is still cold from the broken window. Okay. What next? Let's see what we can do with the tape measure. The tape player. Equip this to play tapes. Um...
Okay, I mean, there's not much more to do. Let's interact with some items. The Greatest Innocence. Damaged Leather. Ledger. We'll read the book on La Fumée. The front of this quarterly journal features a large satirical portrait of the late King Friso. From the sides of his head, a pair of white antlers spread to the corners of the cover. Why Friseau? Because Friso was incompetent, foolish, and cruel. In short, the embodiment of everything the communards wished to overthrow. It's satire, you see. I flip through the pages, see what catches my eye. To your disappointment, there aren't any full-color pictures to direct your attention. Just column after column of closely set text, interrupted occasionally by little doodles in black and white. After rifling the pages with your thumb several times, you return to the table of contents. The magazine is divided into several sections. International Development, Kunst und Kultur, and Local Concerns. Just inside the cover, there's also an editor's note. Read the editor's note. Comrade, as you know, <coughs> this journal takes its name from Mazov's immortal expression, Du Cristal a la Fume. This was his way of describing the way the rigid, crystalline structures of capitalist ideology turn to smoke under communism. But, like the structures of capitalist ideology, we too are at risk of going a la fume. Unlike many publications which are content to spoon-feed their readers reassuring drivel, la fume is committed to telling the radical truth, even when that truth may drive away potential subscribers. Okay. Only four issues in, and it sounds like they've already alienated their readership. So please, if you value our radical Mazovian perspective on contemporary politics, culture, and international affairs, please consider subscribing today. Yours in struggle, the editors. Ken, I think this is a communist magazine. What do you expect? It was laying around the office of the Debardeurs Union. They're probably bankrolling the thing. You flip back to the front of the magazine. The table of contents unfolds before you. I want to catch up on international devs. This section includes a long, tedious critique of the latest round of free trade negotiations between the EPIS nations and the Free State of Seminine. You also skip over an article about heavy fuel oil smuggling along the Mesk Messina border, something about bear wrestling in Samara, book riots in Yugograd. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bear wrestling. Flip back to that. All right. Let's see what this bear wrestling is all about. It seems to be part of a new public fitness initiative in the People's Republic <laughs> of Samara, SRV, devised and promoted by none other than President Kenijinsky himself. According to this extremely credulous account, Uncle Sport as he's affectionately known to his people, has recently decreed bear wrestling the national sport of the SRV. Hang on. Tell me more about this Uncle Spore. Based on the description in this article, he appears to be an extremely competent and democratically elected president. Sapor Matt Sport Kalazinski is well into his third decade as president of the SR. Holy shit, the Outside lore is so Samara, thick. He's known for three things. Brutal repression of internal dissent, monumental corruption, and a near pathological obsession with physical fitness. Don't forget the moustache. Right, like all Samaran men above the age of 40, President Kalijinsky wears a truly spectacular walrus moustache. Is Samara supposed to be the equivalent of uh, Russia? Right, now let's get back to the bear wrestling. It's quite straightforward. A standard match features one man, or in some cases, woman, against one bear. Two competitors, one ring, five rounds, or until incapacitation. 
According to the SRV's Ministry of Information, the program has been a tremendous success. Public support stands at 87%, and youth obesity and alcoholism rates are down 12% and 7% respectively. This is the SRV we're talking about. If you think those are the real numbers, there's probably a guy who wants to sell you a bridge in La Chere. Uh, I guess it's hard to fight a bear if you're out of shape. That's very much the idea. President Kaczynski has long maintained that a strong body is the best defense against capitalist aggression. Kim, do you think there's any chance our case will take us to the SRV? The Samaran People's Republic? No, I should expect not. Why do you ask? I was thinking it might be fun to see a bear fight. They are quite the spectacular, as I understand. I've heard they make the people in the front rows wear plastic sheets. On account of the blood, you see. Yes. You flip back to the front of the magazine. The table of contents unfolds before you. What is Kunst and Couture? It takes a moment. But gradually it dawns on you that Kunst und Kultur must mean arts and culture. Why they decided to this title one section in Valder is beyond you. As you leaf through this section, you come across several reviews of recent radio plays, as well as a brief artist spotlight featuring a local artist identified only as C.S. The main feature, though, is a long essay titled Tip Top Tourne, a critical Mazovian perspective. The Tip Top Tourne is an inter isolari racing series, mostly known for its high speeds, ludicrous sponsorship deals, and high death toll. In Revachol, it's held quadrinally on the prestigious Zero Carousel racing circuit. <laughs> All right, let's see what these communists have to say about Tip Top. You think you're settling in for a relaxing recap of the most recent season, maybe sprinkled with some nice anecdotes about a few of the more colorful drivers. Instead, you find yourself skimming a 10,000 word feature about all the politically problematic aspects of Tip Top Tourney. Wait, what's wrong with Tip Top? Where to even start? For one, there's the crass commercialism of its sponsorships. And then, there's the practically criminal emphasis on deadly motor crashes. Oh my god, this game is so... <laughs> I I guess it's for, um... It's an acquired taste, definitely. So, all of it, basically. <sighs> Hang on, who wrote this stuff? Oddly enough, this article has two bylines. Nasteb and Kalada Bernal. And Exilus Buka. There's no way those are real names. Wait, why aren't they real names? Have you ever met anyone named Exilus? Come on, they're plainly pseudonyms. What's wrong with a good motor crash? They just keep it interesting. And that precisely is what's problematic about it. At the end of the day, it's the destruction of these. 750,000 real races that you're really watching for. Wow, you're right. I really am just in it for the violence. You see, one cannot avoid the conclusion that Tip Top Tourne is simply the apotheosis of spectacular entertainment under capitalism. Kim, did you know that Tip Top Tourne is actually an orgiastic ritual of capitalistic destruction? I had no idea. I can safely say the thought had never crossed my mind, detective. <coughs> it's too bad. I thought I liked Tip Top. You can still like it, detective. Just because a couple of fools wrote an article doesn't mean it's true. If I had to wager, I'd say they've never even seen the inside of a motor, much less a motor race. I take whatever they write with a large grain of salt. You flip back to the front of the magazine. The table of contents unfolds before you. Let's see what they mean by local concerns. Unsurprisingly, much of this section is taken up with articles declaring unqualified support for the dock workers' strike. You skim the headlines. Finally, there's a brief article by the writer 
G. Martin, accusing the owner of the Capeside Apartments of illegally attempting to evict certain communist tenants simply for not having paid their rent. Uh, how do I feel about rent? Well, as a society, we don't all get to agree on whether or not who, in fact, owns land. And so having to pay to stay on land, albeit developed and accommodized land, is a uh, simply nonsense to me. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better f for everyone if labor and capital could reach some reasonable accommodation? According to these editorials, there can be no accommodation with the forces of international capital or their mucilaginous allies in the coalition. Hold on. What's this about a coalition? Judging from the context, it's something very large and fundamental. You should probably know about it already when you flip back to the front of the magazine. Well, that was um, arduous, truly. Let's, uh, I'm just gonna skim these real quick. An intricate web of blue, the pattern still kind of gone. For you to, someone. Hmm. The note is written. Someone has screwed. You find the Philip. Looks like someone from that radio game company upstairs. And that's a plausible hypothesis. Really? Oh, I'm sure that. Oh boy. It's just a race, but it's the ledger you found in the trash. A cabbage of papers hanging from the board. <clears throat> the permeables draw inside. Browse the case files again. Arson, petty theft, spousal abuse, handwritten logs on duck. You don't exactly. It takes about half an hour to piece one together using the system you've devised. Which one do you want? Okay, let's um peruse and review our previous cases. The next world mural. This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight on 1202, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking central Jamrock. The building is a sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Coudon. Cause of failure, rent too high. Oh, hey. Look at that. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible only in the next world. For new people, it is too late for us. Wreak havoc on the middle class. People call it that thing and that fucking thing. It's visible for miles. In two days, the station's complaints desk gets clogged with requests to remove the bummer. You and your partner are assigned to the case. The graffito crew is easy to track down. Only the bell lectures have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the graffito artists is rumored to be rich. They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue of the next world mural, as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. Wait. Do I ever find out who came up with it? The case files do not show you finding the author of the design. The crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner, JV, is against the removal, citing public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite organized by you and the rest of Row 3. The 9,000 people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villa Lobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rambling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between two options. Uh, <laughs> opinion forming. You know, I'd keep the mural. It is right. A staggering 78% of voters choose to keep it. 
turns out the opposition were a loud minority. And that love truly is possible in the next world for new people. And it is too late for us. All that remains is to wreak havoc on the middle class. The middle class are not to be blamed. It's human nature. Did anyone ask you what you believe in, man with the smelly toilet ledger? Shut what up. What do you want to do? <laughs> not much has changed. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to go to the garden shed and investigate that little door. We'll use our character skill to um, boost it and see if we can't get another shot. Last time, it was a pretty high percentage and we failed anyways, unfortunately. Uh, we have um, about an hour left before we can go talk to the smoker in the apartment in apartment 28 i believe so let's um do that and maybe we'll review more of our ledger before then just to pass the time okay an inconspicuous pile of the roofing material eat tonight why am i looking at this pile of the roofing material because there's a secret door hidden behind the panels of eat tonight that's why they're too orderly. Pull the panels aside. There it is. You see a shabby little door. What is this, Dan? A tool shed? Let's investigate. Okay, nice. Feels good to have some successes for a change. <laughs> Go in. <clears throat> A silver plate with traces of bone yellow powder. Be still, my beating heart. It's amphetamine, sweet amphetamine. The lieutenant isn't studying the powder in the mirror. He's studying you. There's a good vague way to ask where he stands on drug use. Professionally, I mean. Ah, <laughs> uh, these options. Someone's taking narcotics here. Perhaps the police should interfere. Perhaps not. This is below our pay grade, detective. However... He points to the ladder in the corner. See that ladder there? It's probably another way into the industrial harbor, no? A secret path the local kids use. Oh, we could have taken this way instead of uh, finding the measurehead, I think. The poster says, get out of the way or get fucked up. Cured pig's head. It looks mummified. An empty tube of magnesium. Uh, magnesium, magnesium supplement. A magnesium supplement you rub on your chest to live a happy, magnesium-rich life. Yep, I guess it uh, doesn't hurt to uh, explore. Money. This doorway is going to collapse soon. Restoration pillars keep the ruins together. Postcard. Grand Coron. 37. I'll take it. Money. Dollar. Items. This postcard depicts an ill-advised residential area overlooking the Jamrock Quarter. 
Thirteen-story buildings lined the hillside like sarcophagi, an ominous fog already rising from behind. These are the last boom years. In 39, the project failed ca catastrophically, leaving behind an opiate and hepatitis B-infested slum. Hmm, interesting. Ooh, I wanna access those areas. <laughs> Not so fair. Wow, look at that. Money. More money. Well, uh, I guess we can't really go anywhere from here. Not accessible. Fuck does Kuno care? Kuno, I found your shack. You found Kuno's secret door to Kuno's secret shack. It was closed for five thousand years. How the fuck did you get in? I face shifted through the roofing material. Shit! Get the fuck out of here! You can't do that. You can't do that, Kuno. He's trying to fuck at you again. Pigs can't displace. Can't do that teleport shit. How did you like it in there, pig old boy? Kuno's got a lot of cool shit there, right? <coughs> What's with the tube of magnesium, Kuno? It's a vitamin, pig. Don't you know anything? He looked at you like you just pointed at the sun and asked what it was. You could use some. It's magnesium, right? Yeah. It's the Mac. You fucking need that shit to stay on top of your game. Kuno goes through like a tube a day, rips Mag like a motherfucker, and you could use a bottle. Oh, don't teach him, Kuno. He's gonna use it against you, Kuno. Come on. It's just magnesium. Don't mystify it. You're not getting this, pig. It completely takes away the hangover. It's like you didn't do anything. Like you stayed home playing with your choo-choo. You pig, don't do mag. You're gonna OD and you're gonna fucking die. What was with the pig head? Oh, that. Kuno decapitates pigs. That's just a Kuno demo tape. Hmm. <laughs> demo tape? Like some kind of musician. Yeah, Kuno plays on snuff radio, fucks pigs live, fucks their heads off. Kuno's a cop killer. I found a plate covered with powder residue. Know anything about it? That's where Kuno gets his daily hit of electric. Kuno Shazam. Kuno rides the fucking lightning in there, pig. Bet you'd like to ride the lightning too, wouldn't you? You feel tired and old, but... Good call, pigmeister. Don't come and talk to Kuno. The fuck do you good call, pigmeister? Kuno doesn't fucking care. <laughs> Hear that? Magnesium. That's what you're lacking. The lack of magnesium has you slouched. My mag level is fine. Just an ordinary war. Nothing to see here. Wish I had another uh, level up. Conceptualization. Oh, looks like I missed something. Book Sixteen Days of Coldest April. The cover features a row of concrete buildings with a monochrome rainbow in the sky. It tells a rather excruciating story about two lovers during a period of ethnic unrest in Yugograd. The book has been filled with filed under psychological realism. Let's do it. In your hands you hold 16 days of coldest April by Yekatina Dar. 
The cover image shows a row of concrete apartments, above which span a black and white rainbow. Feels heavy. Indeed, the book is unusually heavy in your hands, as though the cover were lined with lead. How long is this book anyway? You flip through the book. The pages are thinner than you realized, and the type quite small and tightly set. It's nearly 600 pages long. Real art is dense and difficult. If it didn't feel like you had to wrestle a suicidal bear to get through it, you weren't really reading. <laughs> well, I've had my fair share of um, thick books, both uh, enticing and horribly mundane. I look at the back cover. The back cover is dominated by a black and white photograph of the author. And what does she look like? She can't be much older than her mid-thirties in this photograph. And yet, from this cover, the eyes of a sad old woman stare back at you. Let's start reading. In cold, detached prose, the author describes a scene from one of the Hugo Grad riots in the twenties. Youths overturn motor carriages and set trash cans ablaze, while heavily armored guardsmen dash in and disperse them in a flurry of baton blows. The Yugo Grad riots took place from 27 to 29. Fueled by ethnic unrest and the state's repressive tactics, these events are often seen as marking the end of a brief period of liberalization known as the Yugo Grad Spring. Like all such periods, it is frequently memorialized in art and literature. As ethnic tensions run wild, a pair of young lovers meet each other on the street. Somehow, in the middle of all the chaos, they manage to lock arms and look into each other's eyes. What happens next? It would physically hurt you to keep reading. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm afraid I must subject myself to gradient realism. They go through a brief and somewhat awkward love affair. And in the end, they betray each other and succumb to the absurdity of gradient life. The man becomes a lens grinder, completely abandoning his former existence. He toils through the daily drudgery at the Lenka Polyfabricate. Happiness and fulfillment have eluded him his whole life. And in the end, he has nothing to do but dedicate himself to the craft. Oh, that's a little close to home. And the woman. She spends the next several decades standing at a conveyor in a Sosnovor fish processing plant. The smell of fish guts slowly seeps into her hair and skin, as every single one of her dreams dies, one by one. The memory of their short time spent together tortures the former lovers ceaselessly until the end of their days. Years pass in solitude their bodies growing ever more decrepit. Why can't I put this book away? As life leaves their remains between the <laughs> soil sheets, their final thoughts are filled with regret. How lovely. How painful. I'm all about it. Okay, let's speak to the smoker. Enough time has passed. John Damarie, you found me. The young man on the balcony gives you a bright smile before taking another drag from his cigarette. His slender figure is backlit by city lights, its distant streets and motorways flashing like diamonds. We found a key hidden under a stone. Was it yours? It was mine. My friends use it from time to time to visit me. As he looks at you, something sparkles in his eyes. So tell me. Are you here to make things right again? Honestly, I'm just trying not to screw anything up. <laughs> That's what I'm aiming for, yes. Beautiful. A nearby street lamp casts shadows on his chin, drawing out the slender cheekbones. I have some good news for you. My Sunday friend is visiting me tonight. I told him about you and he'd like to say hello. Step in. He's already waiting. By the way, I'm really digging the view here. Mm-hmm. That's why I chose this place. 
Martinez is special, isn't it? Wait. Suddenly you are digging things? Uh, why would I want to meet your friend? Trust me. You do. Um, very well. I'll talk to him. But first I want to talk to you. I have so many questions. That's nice, but I don't have anything to tell you. It's my friend you're looking for, not me. He takes another drag of his unfiltered cigarette and looks around. It's getting dark and the neighboring windows have lit up one by one. Downstairs, a cat crosses the yard, disappearing into the bush. Besides, I've got to run. Something tells you you're never going to talk to an individual this cool or mysterious ever again. But I just found you again. Where, uh, run where? To the city. It's a beautiful night. A man on high heels stumbles out of a basement club, music blasting over the entire district. It's chilly, and as the chemicals hit his nervous system, a thousand shivers ripple through his body. Between these two options, I'm liking the first. Only if you promise that we'll talk again. It's important. Something flutters in the corner of the lieutenant's mouth as you're saying those words. We'll talk. Just not tonight. Take care, alright? How sultry. Ooh, we have a level up. And he's gone again. Looks like it's becoming a theme for him. Let's go, Kim. We have to interview his Sunday friend. Right after you. Quick save. Check the journal. Interview the Sunday friend. Character point. Go inside. What's this? A quarterly business magazine. Party Dragon Silk Robe, plus one drama, plus one electrochemistry. I don't think I'll ever wear this. An old photo of the same apartment, dated year 01. Expensive men's perfume lingers in the air. <laughs> Summer and conical hat, plus one logic, minus one suggestion. Fine, I'll bite. Buckets of paint on a layer of old newspapers. An exquisite canopy bed made of metal. Dishes soaking in a pot. Flyers for underground parties. Dates for open lectures at a local university. An empty ashtray. Transparency has always been our highest priority. Officers of the Revachol Citizens Militia. The man in business casual removes his cufflinks. His hands are clean and well manicured. This is a man who knows the importance of appearances. My name is Charles Vildrouin, and I am an official with the coalition government. I work for the Institute of Price Stability on assignment from Sur la Clé. <laughs> what view? It's dark outside. Isn't it rude for your friend to leave you alone like this? We're old friends. Nothing's taboo between us. He comes and goes. I'm sure you'll see him around. He's very active. I'm all ears, officer. So you actually witnessed the lynching? I'm sorry to say I did, officer. Hmm. Start from the beginning, if you don't mind. Officer, it's very difficult to describe what I saw that night. It was so surreal to me, like in a play. He holds out his hands and blossoms his fingers, like a drama teacher set in the scene. What do you mean, like in a play? It was just so strange. I could barely comprehend what was happening. I was on the balcony when it happened, getting some fresh air. 
I remember that first they came in, carrying what looked like a body. And then I saw all the surrounding windows go dead one by one. That's when I understood I should not be seeing this. Sounds like the victim was unconscious, or at least incapacitated. Well done, detective. <sighs> Who were they? Can you describe them? I couldn't see their faces well, and there were quite a few of them. But they were very loud and very... Martinez. Let's just say that the laboring classes can get rather expressive with their profanities. How many of them were there? I couldn't tell you exactly. Less than ten. Maybe eight? The lieutenant sends you a sharp look at the mention of that number. Were any of them big? Like 200 kilograms huge? That's a giant you're describing. No, they were all quite human. As far as I could tell. And what happened next? I went back inside. Were you able to see anything from inside? Officer, the yard was pitch black. There was nothing to see, but I could still hear their voices. They were threatening to kill that poor man. <sighs> were they men or women? All men, I presume. But again, I couldn't see very clearly. Hmm. But we are fairly certain the lady driver was present. Are you sure at least one of them wasn't a woman? It's possible, officer, but I cannot say with certainty. It was very dark, you must remember. What ethnicity were they? I believe they were mostly white, though I believe I saw two Aeropagites among them. And I am quite certain that one spoke with a mask accent. And what happened next? Well, that's the strangest part, officer. Nothing happened. It was oddly quiet for a public lynching. What do you mean, nothing happened? They lynched the guy. Eventually, their shouts died down, and that was all. There were no gunshots, no celebratory shouts, no anything. Just an ordinary war. Conceptualization, <laughs> I mean. To see Conceptualization. Sure, understand creativity, see art in the world. And we will be cheating for this one. Just an ordinary war. Nothing to see here. Because you see it. Finally. This wall is sublime. Look at it. The shadows. The colors. Let the conceptual joy flow into your pupils and blossom into thoughts in your brain. All the other walls on all the other houses must make a pilgrimage in adoration of this. The uncontested pinnacle of Warcraft. Color peeled from the very face of God. More. Oh, wall father. <laughs> Kim, I must paint this wall. Add even more beauty to it. Huh? He sounds tired of it all. Cindy the Skull has all the necessary materials. Talk to her. I must talk to Cindy. Get the necessary materials from her. If you must. All right, Art Cobb. I'm tired. <laughs> See you in the morning. Well, now we'll properly slay save. The bed is still cold from the broken wind. The bed is still cold from the wind blowing in from the broken window. <laughs> Here we are again, my broken bird. The waves are coming, carrying you away. But you can't go. No, you have to stay always half aware of yourself. You're not cooperating, brother man. Why? It's your disgusting body. Even through your sleep you feel a vague discomfort suffusing it. Your belly and your sides are unpleasantly tender. You wish you could curl up into a fetal ball of safety. 
But you cannot. Because of the pain. Okay, one moment. Okay. That pain in your right side is your enlarged <clears throat> liver, by the way. As for your kidneys, you've really been compounding the damage lately. But this suffering, it must have some kind of meaning. A story that will come out of it. Perhaps even a story that you will write yourself. I think I need medical attention. Oh yes, they'll check you out, give you some pills, make it all okay. The Wonder Makers. Don't be stupid, Harry. It's not happening. They don't make new kidneys and livers in hospital. All you've got to do is pray to God it passes and stare at the flickering darkness. You're just stuck here in the half world. Could try looking at other people, really looking. But why would you want to start doing that? Ooh. I will. I'm looking at people all the time. I like them. Sure you do. They're all so friendly, aren't they? Mm. At least they're interesting. Each one has a process just like yours, running in the space between their ears, full of secrets. People are beautiful, statuesque, parodies and tragedies of themselves, a great democracy of creatures. What do you think you're doing right now? Coming to some greater awareness? Look at all these lights, blinking in and out of existence, thoughts! You're just pretending that you're asleep, even to yourself, while the world goes on without you. Let it. Let it. But it never seems to let you go, does it? Time to rise and wipe that shining sweat off as best you can. Gather your bearings. Rock and roll. I open my eyes. <sighs> okay, it's Wednesday. Um, I think I'm gonna call it. You're not looking too good, friend. Okay, 7.30. Yep. I'll see you guys in the next episode.